Hi, good morning, and I hope you're keeping yourself safe and staying at home, following the social distancing norm. Uh, today, I'll be talking about a very interesting topic, and that's very close to my heart. And uh, I've been working on this aspect for uh, quite some time. Uh, I'll be talking today uh, why we do what we do. It's more uh, about our behavior. And uh, uh, please follow the slides uh, and you will understand that uh, why we behave or why we do what we do, right? So starting with the presentation, uh, I wanted to talk about that our behavior is uh, very, very influenced uh, by our belief system because the way I believe uh, accordingly, I think, and the way uh, I think uh, I conduct myself as far as the behavioral aspect is concerned. So moving ahead, uh, so the next question which comes to our mind is you know, why we behave the way we behave. The same person who behaves very good, reasonably at one point of time becomes unreasonable at another point of time. Now these are the things which we need to understand because if we understand, then we can make uh, you know, the workplace, our, you know, our relationships much better. So as I said earlier, I have realized and I have found that uh, the behavior and belief, uh, individual beliefs are very closely related. Now they have a very significant connection and this and today I'm in my presentation, I'm gonna explore this connection of belief, behavior and the personality. So uh, thinking about those terms, as I said earlier, you know, uh, the belief uh, influences our behavior and our behavior reconfirms our belief system. Now, this is something which is, uh, you have to, you know, as I speak to you through this presentation, you have to take a moment for yourself, think about it, and then you will realize and appreciate that what I'm trying to say makes sense to you. Don't just uh, uh, pass on this presentation, uh, it's just like a presentation. You know, you, you start connecting with the thoughts, right? The very simple thoughts, it says, if I believe something, I accordingly, my behavior would be. If I believe that I'll be exploited, then I will conduct myself accordingly, right? So moving ahead, as I said earlier, the way I think, accordingly I feel. And this feelings guides my behavior. If I think good about certain things, I feel good and I behave very courteously with the people around me. If I think that, you know, I'm being, as I said earlier, things are not going in my favor, I feel bad, and then accordingly, my behavior is influenced by my feelings. So what exactly a belief is, basically? It is a trust mechanism through which we make sense of the world, right? Yeah. It is our belief only that makes us to believe that, you know, Lord Ram was a Mariada Purushottam. We have not seen him, we've only heard about it. And similarly, for a Ravan, we think that he was an evil, right? He was not a good person, right? We've not seen him, but it is our mechanism through our mechanism of a trust through which we make sense of the world. And it is very essential for the survival uh, in, you know, in the world. So belief, uh, as I said, it's a trust mechanism and it comes, springs and it sprouts from our imagination. Now, how do we imagine? Let's like, say, as I said earlier, it is our imagination which makes, or we have read somewhere in the books and the scriptures uh, about certain, you know, uh, leaders. So we, we imagine those things and that imagination, the stronger the imagination, stronger will be the belief, right? So that's the real connect between the belief and the imagination, right? So belief is again, basically very, very subjective. Now, when I say, you know, subjective, it means that how I perceive certain things will be different from the way you are going to perceive the things. So that's something like, let's like say for instance, if you look at these two figures over here, nine and this another is six, you know, if we, somebody will say, I say that they both are nine, you may say that, you know, the first one is nine, the other one is six, right? So that's again, the, the, the truth or the belief systems cannot be a generalized or a common, right? How I perceive, how I interpret, how I make my trust mechanism decides my belief system, right? So it's a very subjective. We, uh, sorry. 
We all have our own customized, personalized, subjective version of the reality that no one else can access. As I said earlier, belief is basically a lot of, do, lot of it has to do a lot with the imagination. Now, the way I imagine will not be possible that you also imagine the same way. So all of us, yeah, this is the speciality of the human beings that we have a own customized, personalized, subjective reality which stays in our head that no one else can access, right? What is think, what is going on in my mind? You cannot access to it, no matter how many instruments or scientific things you use, you still you will not be able to access completely how my mind is processing certain information. So it becomes, the, all these subjective truth or the beliefs becomes very, very unique, right? It is not common, right? So I have my belief system, you have your belief system. Your belief system guide your thinking and your thinking guides your feelings and your feelings are influencing your behavior, right? And so it does with me also. So we assume, and the problem is that given we knowing that okay, all of us have an individualized, customized, unique, subjective truth, we believe and we assume that our subjective truth to be the objective truth. Now, I, I, when I assume certain things, I believe that the rest of the world is also going to think the way I think. Is it possible? No, it's not, right? So I assume uh, my subjective truth to be the uh, universal, right? It is going to be applicable to everybody. With failing to understand that like the way I think, the other people are also thinking in the same direction. Now, subjective world in the head, which I have created for myself, can be controlled. Right. That's, you know, that's the job of the psychology. But controlling outside objective world is very, very difficult, right? I, the way I think, I cannot force you to think the way I think. I cannot force you to believe the way I believe. I cannot force you to imagine things the way I imagine things, right? So that's the, you know, I'm bringing, I'm coming down to the crux of the problem that why our behavior at times changes, right? So, and when we, you know, have a strong uh, subjective truth with the notion on a strong belief that it is going to be the objective truth, everybody's going to follow that. So we, the stronger our subjective belief system, the, the stronger our tendency to cling to our customized, unique uh, subjective truth. We, we hold on to our truth, right? And we are very, very convinced that our subjective truth or belief is the rational one. That is, that is what we, I think, what I feel, what I believe, what I imagine is the perfect thing. That's the whole world has to follow and that's the only thing which uh, is right. And we are very, very convinced that the other people who are there with me or working with me, their subjective truth, which they have imagined, which is unique to them, which is their belief system is irrational. Now, how, how now see that if you understand what I'm trying to say is, then you can you will appreciate that that's the root of the problem. That is, I think that the way I think is the right, and the way other people are thinking is wrong. So, in, in what will happen in that way, you'll find soon. We want our subjective truth to be accepted by the others, and that is the problem. So that means if I think that you know this person is bad, I want every other person in the room to feel that that person is bad. Uh, I have come to this conclusion that this person is behaving, his behavior is bad because of my perception of certain things, right? But that doesn't mean that that person is bad, right? So eventually uh, the, the problem that we the, our behavior becomes irrational at times is because we want our subjective truth to be accepted by the others and we feel that it's a universal truth as a result we find it that we enter into a conflict right when i say conflict that means uh, you know when there is a clash of ego there is a you know clash of belief system the clash of imagination clash of uh, unique interpretations and in, uh, in, you know perceptions things become difficult right and this conflict is further amplified because when I say that I, my thinking is right, your thinking is wrong. So what I'm trying to say is I want you to control the mind of those people who are around me. I am trying to influence them. I'm saying that, no, the way you think is wrong. Start thinking the way I think. And that's not the correct way. And so there is a clash of subjective truth. That is now that you first time you are entering into a conflict zone where you say that your subjective truth is the right, the other person says their subjective truth is the right. So then you will find that now we will find the two things that is, I have my view and you have your view. So first, 
you know, differentiation comes amongst at the workplace or in the relationship everywhere you'll find that, you know, people have their individualistic view. And these views, when they clash, they create conflict. So if I'm giving you a small example, how belief behavior influences our conduct, right? So if I believe that the authority will exploit me at my workplace, so my behavior will be to defy that. And I conduct myself uh, without focus, focusing on the organization goal, I work for individ, uh, individualistic actualization, right? And if I believe that authority is caring, concerning, then I, my behavior would be to follow the organizational goal and I work for the collective growth of the organization. Now, this is a small example which you can connect with. That is how your belief system influences your behavior and how your behavior governs your actions. Now, at this point of time, I would like to bring, uh, you know, uh, the, I will talk about it. Uh, we normally cling or we normally hold on to the, you know, uh, most familiar emotions and it's very unfortunate that we are most familiar emotion is not the happiness which it should be uh, if i ask you if i ask you to ask you to guess that the most familiar emotional response to any challenge or a change is what right i'll just give you a small clip so you can have any guesses right i'm sure you got it right right so the, the response would be the fear that the most emotional, uh, favorable, or I will say that the most favored or the most familiar response to any change or a challenge is the fear. Now, the another part of the fear is when you are when you are feared, you know, you 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 opt for resistance. You start yelling. So no matter whether you are fearful, you are resisting, or you are yelling, you are behaving in a very very compulsive way. That means you are not getting adjusted according to the circumstances in which you are. You're, you are, in a way, you are reacting, you're not responding. Now, looking into this present situation in which we all are, that is COVID-19, uh, the world is going to change. It is not going to be the same the way we were earlier. The sooner we accept this fact, the better it is for all of us. So in that situation where we are, we are all uh, are in, it is essential that we should not behave compulsively. Right? We should learn to respond. Now, when I say learn to respond means, I'm talking about taking time to observe, you know, understand, empathize, comprehend, and then decide to choose or, or choose your course of action. But when you say you are a compulsive behavior, you are non-empathetic, you, you don't have gratitude, uh, you, you know, outrightly uh, reject or, you know, discard any change or, you know, a challenging situation. So this brings me to a point that I was, okay, I started with what the situation was, how, and I'm finally coming down to a point that why we do what we do. So I hope you understand as of now, if you realize why we do what we do is simply based on the fact that we human beings have a special gift that is, we can imagine first and most important thing. This imagination creates a belief. This belief is nothing but a trust mechanism that helps us in understanding uh, what is right, what is wrong, and that's how we make sense of the world. Now, this subjective truth of the belief which we have created from our experiences or we have learned from our the parents and the surroundings uh, starts influencing our behavior, right? And we, as an individual, feel that the way we think, the way we imagine, the, the way we have uh, seen, we feel that the way we feel the world is, everybody should be feeling the same way. The problem that we feel that our subjective truth has to be the universal truth, which is not. It is not only we are thinking, everybody around the world is thinking in the same direction. So as a result, there is a conflict, right? And when there is a conflict, then what will happen? that you first time realize that there are two different uh, types of views are coming. There's a clash of egos, right? The clash of the views, that is, this is my way of thinking, this is your way of thinking. So when this is my way and your way of thinking comes, so then obviously our imaginational, imaginal response to this clash of the view, uh, views is to resist to the changes and the challenges. And in doing so, we become uh, you know, compulsive. And this compulsive behavior is governed because we are very fearful. When we are fearful, we our behavior is you know changed, right? 
So that's what I was talking, right? So when you are fearful, I'll just like to remind you what psychological uh, body physiology changes happen as we are fearful, right? Uh, but when you are in a fearful state, your body's physiology resist, makes you not to think, right? It will not allow you to introspect and to see what is right, what is wrong. No. It will resist you to empathize, right? It will shift your preferences from, you know, intangibles to the tangibles, right? But when I say tangi intangibles to tangibles, you're more uh, attracted toward the physical things, right? Uh, your behavior, you shift from your behavior to what your belief, right? Again, going back to your subjective reality is the easiest way to counter uh, act with the fear, right? Uh, from complex uh, situations, you prefer to be the simplistic solutions, right? Yes or no types. You, from uncertainty, you prefer to the predictability. Now, fear is basically an imaginary response to the perceived challenges or change, as I said earlier. So, and this fear is further fueled by our imagination. And on top of it, I imagine that uh, science has proved that human imagination is, you know, you know, it's limitless. It can go to any extent. Like, I can uh, be in this room and my imagination can take me to, you know, uh, let's say, for instance, Himalayas, and uh, I can be there and come back in fraction of time, right? So each individual has the ability of customizing his or her own subjective truth reality. That's perception, as I said earlier, my reality and the my way of looking into the things. So this imagination or this perception, which I spoke earlier, I have a right or I have a choice. Either I can expand it, that is, I can expand it. So like say, for instance, if you look at the imagination and the perception of the movie makers, some of the great movie makers, right? Like say, for instance, even the people who have, construct, who have built the Taj Mahal, right? Uh, Eiffel Tower, their imagination and the perception was, you know, you can imagine how expanded it is. So when you expand your perception or imagination, you know, you become boundless, right? You can contract it, you know, as you can, you know, make your thinking very, very rigid, right? You can crush it, you can limit it. Right, you you have the options of doing it. That's what the power of you know uh, thinking, and that's what they call meditating and things like that. In meditation, they teach you how to expand your imagination. And this all process of expanding, contracting, crushing, and limiting is used for creating the unique subjective uh, you know uh, reality. What you call it as truth. So this subjective reality help us if it is expanded. I can choose what I wanted to see. For example, if you look at this glass over here, I feel that this glass is half filled. Somebody sees that it is half empty. The other person says that the reality is that there is a glass and there is some water in it. Now there are three versions of it. And depending upon your subjective realities, your belief system, you will perceive this glass in a different way. We can choose what we want to value in a relationship, right? Depending upon, our subjective truth. Like say, for instance, as I said, when we are fearful, we are not bothered about, you know, uh, yeah. we, 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 we don't concern about the behavior. We switch over to exactly our belief system. So at this point of time, it is essential that we now establish a clear-cut relationship between imagination, personality, and the behavior. Now given a chance, if I ask you, what is a personality? How will you define a personality? Right, so personality is how we think and feel about ourselves. It's exactly like if I feel my, if I think and feel about myself good, so you will find that my personality will definitely be, you know, coming it out more stronger. And uh, if I think and feel that, you know, I'm naive, it will come out accordingly. Right. So personality is basically, in a way, the how we feel and how we experience the emotions. So. The feelings and emotional emotions are going to play a very important role in governing or influencing our personality. Uh, if you understand this, then, uh, you know, when I say personality is influenced by feeling and, uh, uh, you know, behavior, then you can understand that imagination influences our behavior. Uh, if I imagine uh, myself, to, uh, myself in a, uh, you know, threatening situation, you'll find that my behavior will be different. If I find myself, or if my imagination gives me this perception that I'm in a very safe and comfortable position, my behavior will be very, very different. Now I'm coming back to a very important point in the corporate when we work. We have to see that, okay, that we are not doing anything which is unnecessarily forcing other person to imagine that the situation is not in his or her favor. 
Now, imagination, as I said earlier, this fuels our conduct and actions. Now, if I imagine myself to be in a you know dangerous situation or you know in an, in an environment like uh, which is not friendly, my behavior will be very very different. As I said earlier, if you feel safe and secure, you're very confident. If you feel threatened and challenged, you know, you feel, you know, intimidated, you know, you don't, uh, I mean, you feel insecure. Like, uh, if you feel, uh, you know, uh, irrational at times, or if you are very, very compulsive, the other person, uh, you will come across to the other person is very, very irrational. If you're very willful, you know, cheerful, you appear to be very well determined that you're going to go get a type, you know, I'm going to do it. Now, this brings us to a point that can behavior be changed, right? I mean, I am quite, you know, so you should understand this concept of if you have seen all this, uh, the things which I have spoken, and I'm sure you will be able to connect with them. So can feelings and behavior be changed? That's an important aspect. Now, I, this, this is an important uh, consideration which you must think on. Uh, can I, somebody influence or can we as a person change uh, the way we feel and this accordingly our behavior, uh, can we change that? And the answer is to the good thing is that yes, the only answer is yes, we can change the feelings and we can change the behavior. But the big question comes how? Now, the simple thing is by outgrowing the fear. Now, the only problem we are facing is in our behavior is whenever, if we are not feeling fearful, if we are not feeling the fear, our behavior is very, very pleasing, right? We conduct ourselves in the best possible way. But when we are in a state of fear, then we try to, you know, we change our behavior because the body chemistry changes, you know, the hormonal system reacts in a different way and accordingly our, our responses are different, right? So let's understand the fear. So human manifestation, and if you look into it, it's at the, at the three levels I have tried to comp uh, comprise in the presentation. The first is the body level, the physical level. That means that how nature sees us. How I, how I, what is my constitution and what I have inherited from my parents and how I'm fueling my body. The second is the mental level, that's the intellect level, then how we see ourselves. How, what is our perception about ourselves, right? That's it. And the third is the social level, how society and others sees us. Now, uh, I hope I will try to connect all these things to you. All the levels, whether it's at the mental level, the body level, or the you know, social level, they require nourishment. Now, these nourishments are coming in the form of you know, exchanges. Like, say, for instance, uh, you give your body you know, food, uh, water, you know, everything. So the body is exchanging it with the, you know, making it fit, and it survives. You read, you learn, you, you, know, you observe things, you are you know, making it strong, your intellectual, you know, your personality, right? You're, you're feeding, you're nourishing your mind, right? That's what they say that reading a books install a new software into the brains. And the third level is the most important, that's the social nourishment. Now, this social nourishment is the, out of these three uh, levels, you know, you will find that, uh, the first level is nourishment goes in the form of food for the body, for the knowledge goes for the intellect, and our behavior is nourishment for the social level of our manifestation. Now the nourishment needs for the social level is the highest, and that's the problem. That is, uh, I put it in this way that uh, I want, uh, because why is it high? You can easily understand that the rest of the two are in my control, right? I have access to those things. But the third social level nourishment comes from, the, from my peers, from my people, from my relationship. You know, they are going to you know, validate. Uh, because in social level, I am mainly concerned how I am being perceived or seen by my colleagues and the other people in the society. And that's the reason I wanted to project myself the best, right? So when I talk about the, you know, uh, nourishing of the three levels, it always happens with the exchange, right? So at workplace interactions are exchanges. I do something for you, you do something for me. We, ex uh, we exchange our, for fuel, fulfilling our desires, basically. So normally, at the level, uh, when, uh, when I talk about these, uh, you know, exchanges uh, to, uh, for the manifestation of body level and uh, intellect level as well as social level, we are trying to fulfill our desires. 
Now, it, these exchanges reduces the effort of finding because, uh, you know, it's easy because uh, I appreciate you, you appreciate me. Uh, I don't scratch your back, you don't scratch my back. That's the principle I can easily explain, right? But with the exchanges, the problem arises too, right? It increases the burden of expectations, right? Like, say, as I say, for instance, when I exchange something, so then the burden of expectations increases. Right? Then if I exchange something with you, you, know, you may expect something more from me or I may expect something more from you in return. Then there is a burden of obligation. That is, uh, I did it for you, so you must do it for me. Right? And there is a burden of uh, satisfaction also, the giver and the receiver. Now, I may be giving, ex exchanging uh, something for you, right? But you may not find it worth it. Similarly, you are doing something for me, which I don't find it worth it. So there is a burden of satisfaction also. There, and this all creates burden of anxiety. Like I do some work for my boss, but I'm, I'm still anxious whether he or she likes it or not. Boss does something for me, and he or she also is anxious to find out my response for his gestures. We expect to be validated in the society that relentlessly invalidate us. Now that's the important part I have been talking for quite some time, that we should learn not to get external validation. And this is a small example. You, every day, you know, we, uh, you know, we go to the office, we greet each other and uh, and if you say somebody to someone that, oh, you look gorgeous. So you, you will find that that person, you know, blossoms because that's the validation is working very great, beautifully for him. Similarly, if you find that, you know, as you walk into the office, nobody acknowledges your presence, which means that you are not being validated in the surroundings where you've been spending most of the time. So that's the important aspect of, so, if you are more focused on validating yourself, and this validation sense of the validation comes from the social nourishment and need of our manifestation. And it's very unfortunate that we prefer social growth to the mental growth. Now I'll come down to an important point, like everywhere on the social media or everywhere, be it TikTok or Facebook or everywhere, people are talking about, you know, that we're locked down and we cannot move out and it is frustrating, it's bothering. I was wondering as to, to that when we were going to the work, we all were talking about that uh, we don't get holidays, we don't have time to spend with the families. Now, when we have the time, we are craving for it. So there must be some reason behind it. Then I realize, I mean, I mean, I maybe mean, not right, but that's how I think. But is it not that we are not getting the social nourishment or the validation from the outside people and from the peers? So that is not making us feel good about it. Exactly, that's what we do it on Facebook. When you post a, on a face uh, something on a Facebook, you keep on checking it every second that how many people have liked it. And if people are not liking it, that you're you are not socially validating your, you know, uh, so your social needs are not met. And this is the reason that you feel you know more burdensome when you are in a situation staying at home. Here comes a point that if we are preferring more for a social growth, then we are compromising somewhere or the other. And that's again is influencing our belief. And this influence behavior, is, uh, belief system is going to influence my thinking. And this thinking will influence my behavior. The reason for all this is that we have a strong desire for wealth, power, position, fame, and recognition. And you have to answer this question is why we want all of them? Because the point is, I want to control. You know, I just simply want to control my surrounding, the people around me. Yes, when you are in a situation where you can control things, you feel powerful. And when you are in a situation where you cannot control certain things, you feel powerless, right? So fear of losing control and power makes us fearful. Now we're coming to the end of the presentation, so we must consolidate what we have discussed so far. So anything, so if you realize why we do what we do, the real root cause of this why we do what we do is whether we are fearful or we are not fearful, right? So if you are in a state of fear, your behavior will be different. If you're not in a state of fear, your behavior will be different. So even as a matter of fact, the researchers are proving that the organization must make sure that they're where they in an environment, working environment, an employee feels safe and secure. Because the more an employee feels safe and secure, his behavior will be better. He'll be working for the organization goal. Same goes in the family. If your children, if your parents, if your peers, if your family, if your friends, if your relatives, if they feel, if they feel, you know, if they feel fearful, 
then the behavior will be very different. And that's a recent research going on in this direction. So this has come to the, I hope you will now make a sense that why we do what we do, right? So the time to talk about the takeaways, like uh, what are the final takeaways? Like I say that expand the mind, right? So, and outgrow the fear. Now, when I say expand the mind, I'm not going to talk, uh, I mean, sound very philosophical or something. I say that the best way I have observed is that expanding mind is I, how I perceive is the volunteering. Now, when you volunteer, the point is uh, you learn so many things by volunteering, right? Helping is the other one, right? I feel that helping should be made as pro-social behavior or social norm, that where everyone is trained or you know taught to that to help each other. We must be very, very generous, very respectful. We should have reasonable expectations from the others. We should be very, very compassionate, and our behavior should be very, very responsible. If you do all these things, or maybe any few of these things, you'll find that you have the possibilities or the chances of expanding your mind. Another important thing is be watchful for your actions because you must remember that the intentions are not visible, your actions are. Now, why I'm saying so, as again, I'll conclude by my, coming to the conclusion of my talk, that is anything and everything that we do in a workplace or at a family or in a relation or anything, anywhere, we should be making sure that how our actions are going to be perceived. If, it is, if they're going to be perceived as a threat, we are creating an environment of a fearfulness. If it is so, people will behave very strangely, trust me. But if our behavior, our conduct, if our approaches or you know, the way we conduct ourselves, if it is giving an impression or creates and helps in creating an environment which is non-threatening, you'll find people will behave differently. So be watchful of your body language. Remember, 55% of our communication is evaluated for nonverbal cues. Like, say, for instance, my voice tone, my postures, my gestures, my uh, timbre, my inflection, how I conduct, how I speak. Uh, yeah, everything matters. Now, these are the things which are, you know, most of the time unconsciously uh, happening. So we must be very careful about our body language, like, the, as they say that, you know, I raise your argument, not your voice. So uh, we must learn to uh, these things you know, in every day to day life so that we can give create an environment which is not fearful now, when you say that i have spoken speaking about non threatening behavior now non threatening behavior simply means that uh, i am conducting uh, myself uh, in a such a way that i have respect for the hierarchy i'm talking about the workplace right say for instance uh, i i wanted to know about uh, uh, like certain, say for instance, my whether my salary has been credited to my bank account or not. Now, the first and the foremost thing uh, about asking about this uh, for me is to the you know my immediate boss, and uh, then immediate boss may find it out for me or he can direct me to you know HR department or so. But if I directly approach HR department about my salary status, then in a way I am breaking the hierarchy, right? I do not have respect for the hierarchy, which may threaten my boss and his behavior may be influenced. So be very careful when you're working in an organization because somehow, because of some reasons, they have made the hierarchy and that we must follow the hierarchy. You know, we must practice empathy. We should be, our behavior should be very, very responsible. We must learn to cooperate and believe me, teamwork, creates a very, very environment, healthy environment which does not have any scope for fear. I would strongly recommend that invest in intellectual growth instead of social growth. I know, that, no, there is a, at this point of time, it is essential we understand what is the difference between social growth and the network growth, right? Network is important for your you know, career progression. But when you say social growth, social growth, you're talking about you know, validation. That is how I look. I, I don't believe in myself. I look forward for someone to say that I am handsome. And that's how it is you are going. Right? So I'll say that invest more in intellectual growth by read more, observe, do not uh, speak, but listen carefully. That's the important aspect. Say no to external validation have been repeatedly telling. Accept yourself the way you are and not the way people want you to be. Right? Practice inclusive behavior. That's the key to it. Always start working in team. Do not think that individually you can do anything. As I say, don't battle against life, right? With COVID-19, you are sure that you know, there's no certainty about it. So as long as we are there on this planet, we make sure 
to that uh, we conduct ourselves in a manner which is non-threatening to the others. And so we become more likable. Be mindful. Uh, be happy. <laughs> That's it. The last I'll say that, leave you with the quote. It says, whenever you go, whatever you, uh, whatever the weather, always bring your own sunshine. Uh, thank you guys for listening to me. And I, if you have any questions related to this, you may uh, forward this to me at the email address, uh, vinod.kr.sharma at gmail.com. I'll be more than happy to uh, welcome the comments in case if you want to share with me about this presentation. Thank you very much for being with me this morning. Thank you. Have a great day. Stay safe. Practice social distancing.